Right, Merry Christmas again. That's awesome. We are excited to be here. We're excited to celebrate the birth of, uh, of Jesus. <clears throat> In case you're new here, I know some of you are new here. I see some visiting faces, and that's awesome. This is Grace Life Bible Church, and we've been moving through the um, Advent steps. And we're realizing that new covenant knowing leads to all the stuff we want, right? Experiencing growth and grace, growing in healthy relationships and impacting others. And so that's kind of where we've been. So uh, welcome here. So we have been mar marching through this little book called uh, The Advent Jesse Tree. And it basically is a super survey from creation all the way through to Jesus. And so we've marched through several weeks of that today is culminating in the, uh, the birth of Jesus, and um, that leads us to the fun part here, right, guys? You want to help out? Okay, so I'm going to come over here and grab this. They, they always get hooked together. So we read, at least some of us read this last week, about Nehemiah and the wall. He rebuilt the wall. Can you hang that on the tree? So the wall of Jerusalem, Jerusalem's the special city, and God allowed the people to experience loss, but then he also guided them to rebuild. And then after that, we have a star, right? This is a star. The star leading the wise men to Bethlehem. And after that, we have, this one might be hard. See if you guys know what this is. What does that look like? It's a candle, but don't start it on fire. Okay, Jesus is the light of the world, signified by a candle. And then we have, what is this? This is, it's an angel, a very fragile angel. The angels announced, do you guys know who the angels announced it to? Shepherds, yes. That was very unusual. Very unusual. We'll talk about that today. And then finally, all of this leads up to the birth of Jesus. There we got a little tiny manger scene. Can you hang that up on the tree? Thank you. I appreciate that. So that, we're officially done with the Jesse Advent tree, because we got it, we, we made it to the birth of Jesus, and that's what the whole Old Testament is about. Good job, kiddos. Here we go. Thank you. Way to go. Way to go. Come on. She probably thought I was going to hit her or something anyway. That's good. Thank you. So, um, oh, look at that. I'm, I'm sorry. You didn't see the, the pictures. Here we go. The star, and then the light of the world. The angel, this is what the kids hung up. Okay, there we go. So, welcome to Advent, yes. Um, now, Tip and Terry are going to read some scripture. And then we can light the candle, or you, that would be great. This is from Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. <clears throat> if you want to read along, it's on page 152 in the Bible that are under the seat. And it says... For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than the other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Good work. It's good to see you back, Tip. I'm glad you you recovered. Thank you so much for doing that. So, yeah, why does... God chose Israel not because they're powerful or a lot, just he chose them. We're going to build on that. But um, have you ever been an underdog, expected to lose? Unfortunately, in, in 
I don't know how far to go down this thing, but, it, but in, in our culture here and where we are the past couple years, decades, we, we kind of know about underdog. I'm just going to leave it at that. But um, it, 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 you know, if you're expected to lose, you're an underdog, okay? But in your own story, who's the hero of your story? Like if you're an underdog and you have success, is that all about you or somebody else? Um, who's the hero of Christmas? If you're thinking Jesus, I'm like, okay, have you held a four-week-old baby? Kind of helpless. Is Jesus the hero of Christmas? Is Mary? Well, we'll get to this, okay? Um, but we live in a world, we've read this quote before, I'll read it again, because it kind of frames how we're approaching Advent. Uh, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul, who know themselves to be poor and imperfect, who look forward to something greater to come. And that something greater is obviously Jesus, right? And so God is really the hero of Christmas. He's the one that sent Jesus. If you read John, I counted this morning, I, I came up with at least 36 uses of the word sent. Specifically, Jesus said, the Father sent me. God sent me. Over 36 times. So God is the architect of Christmas. He's the one that, that created the story. He wrote the Christmas story, right? He sent Jesus without, without God's architect of the, the love story of Christmas. We wouldn't have Jesus' birth, and that's what we're celebrating. So Advent is all about the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love. Um, Jesus represents the fullness of all those, but hope. Without Jesus, we don't have hope. Can you, this might push you a little bit, will we hope in heaven? I don't think so because it's going to be fully realized. I mean, all that we long for will be reality. So here's, here's a verse. Um, for, this, for in this hope we're saved. Now that hope has been, now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes what he sees. If we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Anyway, so, uh, so when we stand face to face with Christ, I don't think we're, we're going to be longing for something greater because he's the fulfillment of that. And peace. Jesus is the ultimate peace. But in our culture, especially in the news this, the, these days, you might think peace is the absence of war. Like if Israel and Hamas, if they have a peace agreement... All it really means is that they're not fighting. There's really not the sense of peace, like the Old Testament word shalom. That means way much more than just not fighting. It means the deepest part is fixed. There's wholeness. There's, there's even wealth and, and contentment. Everything is, is rounded out and complete. And so Jesus does that for us in the middle of a broken world. And then there's joy. In the middle of the broken world, we can have joy. We talk about this a lot here, how in the middle of our problems, we can experience hope, peace, joy, and love. Um, Jesus didn't come to fix all the problems, right? He didn't come to remove all evil, because if he did, then that's a pretty good argument that he doesn't exist. And some people get tripped up in that. They don't know how to handle evil. He came for another purpose, right? And so we have joy, hope, and peace, and love in the middle of those things. Um, so, but the love of God, today we're focusing on the love of God as, as it's really the, the main theme behind the Christmas story. He sent his son because he loves us. The whole Old Testament, you know, if I can say we, Israel, but, you know, we fall away from God, and God doesn't fall away from us. We forget him, he doesn't forget us. We wander away, and he pursues us. And I love this verse in Isaiah. It talks about the fact that God will never forget. Behold, I have engraved your name on the palms of my hands. The walls of Jerusalem are continually before me. Now, when I see somebody with a tattoo in the culture, I just love to talk to them. Like, hey, tell me the story. What's And usually, right, there's like a meaning. Like, well, this, this, and this. Have you, I've never got the response of like, I, I can't remember. Yeah, just, I, it's, I, just, I just can't remember what it was about. Now, 
Elizabeth, a waitress, I've told you this before, in a restaurant, she had a cupcake here. And I'm like, Elizabeth, what's the deal with the cupcake? And she's like, well, I kind of regret it. It was free. I have a, a friend who's a tattoo parlor, and I just picked it. <laughs> but, but she didn't forget. It just had no meaning. Anyway, so I learned that day. I have a meaning. Anyway, it's all right. But the point is, God says, I have my people on the palm of my hand. I will never forget. And there's kind of a cultural thing here. In that culture, sometimes a slave would have the owner's name on their hand. So they could never forget who owns them. And now God is reversing that and saying, I am, I'm, I'm bound to you. And, and I will never be um, separate from you. So the Old Testament and our experiences, we get in trouble by ourselves. But he does not leave us by ourselves. In the midst of all the junk that we create... He loves us in the midst of that. And that's kind of hard to get our head around, right? For ourselves, but even harder for those that we love. Because sometimes we kind of think, well, you need to turn these dials and you should do these things. And, and then here's a list for you. God loves you and I have a list for your life. And, and all of a sudden, all these expectations. And, um, and yet God is loving right where we are. So, I love underdog stories. Underdog stories, people that are expected to lose. Our culture loves underdog stories. I don't know if that is um, worldwide. I should talk to some of my missionary friends to see if other cultures champion the underdog story. But um, a great underdog story is the movie Rocky from way back when. That came out when I was like in junior high. And remember the scene where he cracks five raw eggs and, the, and he just, so my buddies and I would get together and drink raw eggs. It was just a thing we did. But Rocky is, a, is an underdog story. But did you know that Sylvester Stallone is an underdog story? When he, he wrote the script for Rocky the movie, he had $160 in his bank account when he wrote that script. He, he tried to sell it, and he got a buyer that was going to buy it for $360,000. That's a lot of money today and even back then. But the provision was, you, you can't act in it. We just want the story. He turned it down. And then we know the rest of the story, right? So um, he wasn't expected to succeed, and I guess it depends who you ask if he did succeed or not. But anyway, he's, um, he went on and made some movies. All right. So we love underdog stories. Why does God love you? Does God love you because you're the hero? Does God love you because you're a mess? No. God loves you because God is love. It's what he does. He just loves. He is love. He just doesn't do love. Big difference. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you cannot do that changes the loving character of God. Let that sink in. Or as a friend of mine in college used to say, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> it means to meditate. Okay, it's not literal. Anyway, so yeah, there's nothing that we can do or not do. Now, I love this passage in Luke 4. I come back to this very frequently, but Jesus is teaching in his hometown, Nazareth, and he picks up the scroll of Isaiah, and he reads this passage, and he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to... Now, listen to the audience that, that God sent Jesus to address, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to pro proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this is interesting because um, the word captive and the word oppressed, those words, the only time they show up in the whole New Testament are right here. Very unique words. Captive and oppressed. Oppressed means to bruise, to break in pieces, to shatter. I mean, these people are poor, they're captive, they're abused. The Roman culture was, was guilty of much of this, which is why it shaped their whole vision of deliverance for the Messiah. But the, this is the classic underdog audience, right? The captive, the oppressed, the poor. This is who he came to, to address. Now, Scripture is just full of underdog stories. In fact, I was thinking, can you think of a, a, a story in Scripture that's not an underdog story? I mean, Israel as a nation, that's an underdog story, right? Moses, he's an underdog. David, Saul, he puts on the armor, it's all baggy, and then Saul's like, 
You are not able to do this. David's an underdog. Esther, she's an underdog. I mean, you have all these people, Joseph and Samuel and Paul the Apostle and even Jesus, because where he comes from and how he comes, he's, he's not the classic obvious champion of the first week of his existence on earth, right? So the point is here, things are a mess and we can't fix them. We're underdogs. We're not capable. But I know a guy. Okay? And that's where we're going. So Christmas is, is a story about God's love for underdogs. And I'm glad, I'm glad that's the case. We read up here, Deuteronomy 7. Um, why does God love the underdog? Listen to this again. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his position. He just chose them. And specifically, not because you're more in number, but you're, because you're the fewest of people. It's because the Lord loves you, and he's keeping his promise. God is faithful. He will never forget. All right? So, stories of underdogs, whether it's Rocky or another one of my favorite movies. We just watched this a couple weeks ago. It's called American Underdog. Kurt Warner, the, whole, the quarterback from the Rams back in 2000. So, it's a pretty good story. I recommend it to you. Um, He's a guy that was, get this, he was like the second string quarterback for Northern Iowa. <laughs> okay, that means like, you're off the radar. I mean, like, what is Northern Iowa? Is that, there's a football, second string, he's working in a supermarket stocking shelves. He's, his dream is to play, you know, pro football, but he's just, it's like he missed the exit every time, and it's just not going anywhere. And so his life is, is it's, it's, a good, it's a good movie. Uh, he, he marries and dates this woman who has two kids. Uh, one of them is blind. He was dropped as a kid, and uh, just hard. He eventually starts to play like that arena football, and in Canada, this and that moves around a little bit, and then um, he ends up with the Rams, and he they win the Super Bowl in 2000, MVP of the Super Bowl. What? That's that's crazy. It's a great story, right? So. Um, Pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. But my point is we love, we love underdog stories because it, it, it shows us that my story can change. Right? It can change. That's the whole point of the, the, the theme, right? But without God's redemptive love, it, it, I'm still doomed to, to not change. So we love the progress. It gives us hope. Underdog stories give us hope. God gives us hope. The Christmas story is all about the hope that is available through Jesus, to forgive our sins and write a great story. So, the Christmas story is a giant underdog story. I'm just going to run through a bunch of different facts here about, or factors about the underdog nature of the Christmas story. Just look at the manger scene. First off, it's a manger. Right? You're, you're, you're in a, either a basement, the extra room, or a cave, or whatever, whatever it was. It's not the main place. And, and you're born to a couple from nowhere, Nazareth, like, what, are, what, what is that? I mean, Mary's great, but she's kind of confused, like, what, what is going on here? And, and says to the angel, may it be done to me. Oh, okay. I don't get it, but okay. We don't read much about Joseph. So anyway, Mary is an underdog person. Jesus comes for an underdog people, the Jews. They're not mighty. They're not like Assyria or Babylon, but, but the, these are the people that he has chosen. The underdog people, the under, underdog nation, all right? No one gets it, except I love that little random story about Simeon. Some old guy in the temple that's been walking with God close enough that God revealed to him, hey, you're not going to die until you see this Messiah. Wow. And then, and then he holds him and sees him, and that's pretty cool. So Jesus comes in an underdog way, as a baby, vulnerable. In fact, Herod, you get the sense that Herod was probably thinking of looking for a military leader that was going to come back and create a problem for him and, and fight his, his rule. And so that's why he's, he's, um, he's looking out for that. But there's this verse in Isaiah. I'm going to read this. It fits, it fits where we're going. You've heard it before. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and hold it with justice and righteousness for this time forth and evermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
So we've kind of looked at that before. But the context, this is Isaiah 9. The context here is Assyria. It's a big, bad nation, super violent. They had come in in 734 B.C. and just, I won't, it's Christmas, so I won't get into the details, but just uh, attacked brutally the nation as they do every other nation. They were coming back in 722, and this is written here. So Israel is completely freaked out about the threat of Assyria. They have brutally attacked them. They will brutally attack them again, and they have a need. They have a need for deliverance. And Isaiah's best solution here is a little boy's coming, a kid, a child. It's interesting, isn't it? That the, the word here, government, the government, shall, um, of his increase, his government, there will be no end of peace. It's an Assyrian word that, that acknowledges you are subjugated to Assyria right now. The legacy of Assyria is violence and brutality, but the legacy of this child is peace, righteousness forever. And so this is what, this is the hope that, um, that they had. But I also think it's kind of neat. It's like the answer to the, the big war machine of Assyria, it, it's really not that big a deal. A child, my, my answer is a child. A child is going to solve that. And this child is Jesus, the God, man, the incarnate, all right? And so, um, Jesus always does what the Father asks. So, Jesus comes with an underdog purpose. He doesn't come to rule. He comes to die. And he comes to die for the lowest, the underdogs, as well as the highest, if they would choose to follow him. All right? So, he comes to die. He comes announced in an underdog way to shepherds. Shepherds are like the lowest. Like what? To shepherds. I mean, it, it, the, whole, the, whole, the whole thing is so interesting. I've read some apologists talk about the, the Gospels. The way the Gospels are written, you would never write it that way if it weren't true. To, to have all these wrong things, first off, you have four women in his genealogy. Well, that's not what they did, so don't do that because that's, that's going to be dismissed. And then you have... Mary Magdalene, from whom demons were cast out, she's the first one to report this good news. Well, women in this culture, especially with her track record, this is not, if you need to convince people this is true, you're not going to go there. So the very fact that all these weird things are going on that culturally are out of step are proof of its authenticity. Anyway, so shepherds, they're announced. Everything about God and Jesus is pro-underdog. Rooting for the poor, the blind, the oppressed, the outcast. And again, it's all because of God's love. Nothing we can do, nothing we cannot do will change the loving character of God. And this is getting to the next passage that we read up here. First John, love is from God. Whoever has been born of God and knows God loves. Anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. Listen to the verbs here. In this, the love of God was made manifest, made manifest, it was shown to us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, which means substitute for our sins. So Christmas is really a giant love story for the poor, the outcast, and the oppressed. And we would do well to raise our hand when the question is asked, who is poor, oppressed? That's us. We, especially um, in terms of our sin, we, we are disadvantaged. We, we are not expected to win because of sin. We, we don't have an answer for that. We can't fix that. Right? We can fix a lot of stuff where we think we can. But, but sin, I, I can't, I, I don't know what to do with that. Well, I do. I know a guy. That's the only answer. Okay. And so, um, Christmas story is a big story. I saw this hat on Facebook the other day. I love it. I can't, but I know a guy. And there's a cross, obviously, Jesus. So the, the question is, who's the hero of your story? I mean, do we climb up on that, and, and we think we have created a, a wonderful life and done all this great stuff? In reality is, whatever good news we have, whatever good stories we have about the important things of life, right? Like hope and peace and joy and love, those things come from God, and we're not going to find those things unless we admit, I can't. But I know a guy. 
Jesus is the one that makes the Christmas story so powerful. It's about him, and God's love is the reason he sent him to us. So Christmas is a time to remember we are troubled in soul, we're poor, we're outcast, we're blind, we're needy, and we found Jesus, our sins are forgiven, we are okay with God. Isn't that crazy? In the middle of things, maybe this morning things are, are out of sorts and you feel bad about yourself, you're okay with God. That's just an amazing thing. Do you have peace with yourself on your worst day? God can give you peace with yourself on your worst day. In the middle of the things that you wish you wouldn't do or whatever it is, you can find acceptance, forgiveness in the presence of God. It's amazing. So, uh, a couple questions here. Who's the hero of your story? I know it's an obvious answer. Jesus is supposed to be, but sometimes he's not. Sometimes we, we, we think other things. But as I'm, I'm already looking forward to 2024, right? Trying to think of themes and words and directions. As you think of 2024, what would it take for God to occupy a more central role and write your story, your underdog story? I just pray that you would take that thought as we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Jesus, and just think, what would he do? What kind of story does he want to write in this next year? He is rescuing us. It's an ongoing effort. He has rescued us, justification, done. But he is rescuing us as we on, go, grow, and grow, and grow. So um, the bumper sticker for this, this little message, there is hope for the underdog because there's love from God. That's, that's the Christmas story. So Heavenly Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you that Jesus came willingly, faced a lot of odds, didn't have support, had a lot of doubters. Glad that he came, not as a victim, but a, as a champion, a spiritual champion, not a political champion. So anyway, Lord, I pray that as, as we celebrate this Christmas season, that we would slow down and receive your love. And right in the middle of whatever's pressing us, we would realize because of your son's sacrifice, we are okay with you. We want to be quick to move towards you, listen to you, and respond. So thank you for the Christmas message and pray that you would bless us today, tomorrow, and whenever we get together and, and uh, celebrate it with family and special friends. Amen.